Here we are, Isaac Savage, Glad Rap Channel here in Auckland, New Zealand at Neighbourhood Bar with former Olympian Mark Cadell. Also just told me he's representing New Zealand in three different sports. Can you allude a little bit more <laughs> onto that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I did track and field and um, I was in the New Zealand surf lifesaving team um, in 1993. And then I was in the New Zealand bobsleigh team. Bobsleigh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, I did that. Because I broke my back. Well, I went to the Olympics in 96, and then I broke my back. And so I tried for a few years to get it right, and I trained in um, on the QAS, which was part of the Australian Institute of Sport. And so I was quite lucky uh, when I was trying to rehab my back for Sydney Olympics. And um, basically the vertebrae slipped, disc got damaged, and the nerve conduction wasn't there. So surgeon told me I had to retire. So I retired just before the Sydney Olympics. I was really lucky to train in, a, uh, I guess, one of the, well, it was the most sophisticated high-performance environments in the world at the time because yep. uh, Australia put so much money in it. And because the Aussie sprint coach wanted to coach me, uh, I got to sneak in the back door and train in their system which was pretty eye-opening, I guess. And it's kind of like you see what we were doing in Australia in the late 90s. You know, it's kind of like it's only really kind of come here a few years ago. You know, the kind of sophistication. So the techniques, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, and, the, and just the details and of, of the athletes. You know, I mean, I mean, it's probably longer than a few years, eh? But it felt like a few years ago, you know. And so then I, I did some bobsleigh in 2008. I made a bit of a comeback in 2008. So I was in the New Zealand bobsleigh team, so... Yeah, it was a bit of fun, eh? And then the sprinting. Yeah, as well. and then there was the sprinting as well in the nineties, eh? What is your favourite out of all three? Would it be the sprinting or Yeah, I mean Bobsay, I mean, it's funny, they don't let you look at a Bobsay go down the track until you've been in one because you probably won't jump in. And so I remember the first day I was bobsledding and I walked down the track and I was like, Oh man, you're joking me. We're going down this and you're in Lycra and a helmet. <laughs> And there's no brakes, and so I think we crashed on one of our runs, and you know we came off turn eight or turn seven late, and so that means you're always coming onto the turn late and off the turn late, and at mm. some point you just it kind of concertinas out and you just flip over. So all of a sudden we're going probably 130 kilometres an hour, and then you flip over halfway down a track. Now, so the track's two kilometres long, so when you flip out. Um, when you flip out, there's no brakes. So you have to go down the other kilometre on your head. And so all of a sudden, you start, your shoulder starts burning on the ice because you're getting ice burn because you're going 100 k's an hour. And then so you stick your head into it and then your helmet starts melting, you know. And then, <laughs> and then, and then it starts to go uphill at the end. And so you, got, you get to the top of the track and then you come back down backwards. And so it takes like quite a long time to... So you probably don't miss the uh, the crashes then in, in Bob saying It sounds horrific. No, nah, you're not supposed to crash Bob setting, but we did. And that was just the way it was. And, um, you know, it's an interesting experience. You know, it's kind of like uh, being on a roller coaster is like a Disney film. And being in a Bob Slay crash is probably a bit more like, you know, watching a horror, you know. <laughs> so way to put it. Yeah, it was interesting. It was good fun. Now, some may know, may not know that you are a relatively successful business owner with uh, restaurants around Auckland, New Zealand. How did you make that transition from sports to the business side? Yeah, well, I'm kind of nearly out of it, to be honest. Um, but I, to be honest, when I broke my back in 1997, I went to university part-time and at university I sat next to the guy who I went to school with and his uncle owned the Lone Star. So I just went and waited a couple of days a week because I was, you know, bored stupid. I couldn't train properly. So, and when I say break my back, it's not like I'm in a wheelchair. It's just you've got two fractures in your back. You can't train. So I just started waiting and then I just opened some Lone Stars and, you know, I Did you, did you apply any of, I guess, what you learned for our sport to business? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think when I first started off, it's kind of like hospitality is more of a booze culture rather than a performance culture. And I soon figured out when I opened my second restaurant that you have to be a performance culture, not a booze culture, to have multiple sites. And so I essentially just kind of switched back into athlete mode. And <clears throat> I always coached athletes. As a, When I was an athlete, I always enjoyed coach having a little wee group of my own even when I was you know 16 17 I always coached 13 year old or yeah. you know what I mean and so so I've coached a lot and I've been coached by some of the best coaches in the world so leadership and coaching are you know the skills are the same and so being able to communicate effectively to people in the commercial environment um, was pretty critical so I just you know just I basically ran 
sport and a business. Yeah. Do you have a favourite one out there, or one that you you know you've you've ran over the years that that sticks out as one of your favourite restaurants over the years? And a lot oh, of people know probably, about. Probably my favourite one was the White Rabbit actually uh, in the city, but um, we I sold that a few years ago because it was being developed into a construction site, and the landlord wanted it back, so we did a deal. And that's probably my favourite place was the White Rabbit. And um, you know, I used to have a little bar called Smith in Britomart, which was just a tiny little wee bar, and I really enjoyed that as well, just because it was um, small, actually. It was quite yep. nice, rather nice. than having some big monster. But yeah, yeah. It's and now, uh, obviously, we've got to mention some of your b boxing success as well, Junior Far, um, which we'll go into a segue in a minute. But you have you, you're managing boxers now, or managing Junior Far? Who was there before Far, if any? Oh, so I managed to go Solon Pounceby, and he was 20-0. Um, Remember him? And he was ranked number one by the WBO in, I think, July and August 2020, uh, 2012. Um, and, yeah, I also looked after Daniel McKinnon for a little bit. Okay. Joseph Quojo, I managed Mio Menza, got to number six in the WBO. Um, okay. Hemi Ahio, um, so I did Hemi's kind of... I, had, I was with Hemi till 9-0 and oh when Junior... And uh, Lolo Hamuli went their separate ways. I went with Junior and Hemi Stable sure. Lolo, and now I'm now back um, helping Hemi with his um, kind of fight stuff. JC and Steve are, are his kind of managers, and I'm kind of like the boxing. I do the the, the, the matchings for them and, and help them out there. So it's quite fun being swings back and back roundabouts. Home. Eh? Yeah, so it's you quite know? fun being back in with Hemi and also helping Panuvi Hilo out as well now. So that's quite fun uh, looking after those guys, and obviously Nick the Greek as well. Yeah. He's a vicious, vicious fighter. <laughs> so, yeah. How did it all start with you and Far? Um, to be honest, I just helped him at the Commonwealth Games. He decided to, he hadn't trained for a year and a half, and he decided to go to the Commonwealth Games 2014. And so I just gave him a bit of sponsorship so he could take some time off work. And Sky Arena gave him a bit of sponsorship as well. We, 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 we both put something into him. And then, um, you know, he basically signed up with me as a manager. If he was going to turn pro, he said he'd, he'd want me to manage him. And so he decided to turn pro so um, you know we just started a relationship and it started off by me by me helping him out or sponsoring him I guess and then yep. you know I mean I, I mean I just do it for the well-being of the fighters I mean I get a massive kick out of them being successful is what, yeah. that's my real pay you know it's just getting just the fun of their success it's just good fun being part of it what we like seeing as part of your journey too is you bring a different dynamic to it and we've seen you with Far now for probably a good, what, two, three, four years? Yep, three years, yeah. Yep. Yep. And we've seen a bit of a transformation, you know, the highs and lows, but looking at him in the last weigh-in, his last fight, phenomenal shape. This is the best shape he's ever looked. Yeah, look, I mean, I mean you've got to remember, he had three years off boxing, hey, you know. It's funny, hey, someone said that Rossi had had four years off. Well, Junior Far had three of those same four years off. Mm. You know, yeah, Rossi fought for the world title 2011, had a fight 2012, and then gave it away, and then came back as a heavyweight. And, you know, he's kind of 50% win record since since he fought for the world title, and that's just that's just what happens. Some of these guys, they turn into kind of journeymen. And, um, yeah, but, I mean, you know, when I took Junior on, I mean... You know, he, even though he'd been an athlete or boxer for a long time, mm. my challenge was to turn him into an athlete that boxes. And so it just takes time. You know, education, coaching, development, you know, junior skills as an athlete are considerably different than when he started. And his understanding of nutrition, mental performance, force production, the chess of boxing, it's all different now. I mean, I think one of the big changes we made on this fight was... Um, a junior normally listens to Rage Against the Machine and gets all hyped up and he's yep. you know, yelling and screaming as he's coming out of the ring and he's, you know. And this time we're like, no, no, junior, I want you to kind of let it build up inside you so when you get in the ring, you're ready to spend it. And that's what he did. And, he, you know, you saw him walking out of the ring and he's singing away to a reggae song and he's, he's got his eyes closed and he's, you know, he's, he was really enjoying it. Mm. And then we were building the energy rather than spending the energy. And then when the bell goes, the guy just, if he's in a dangerous mood, like the guy, I don't think it matter who was in the ring with him. He was going to destroy someone. And when he gets in that mood, like he did with Fred Latham, it's just yes, a beautiful exactly. thing. And I just don't know how many people can take what he gives at that point. You yeah, know? I mean, that was an amazing performance in the States uh, that time when he finished the guy within the, sort of the same amount of time as what he did down in Christchurch. Yep. And this propels him forward after that win, obviously moving up. Where does he sit now in the rankings in terms of uh, he WBO? Went to, he went to the WBO to number nine yesterday for number 10. So WRA released their rank rankings yesterday. So Junior went up to number nine. And that would 
place him higher than Parker Joseph wasn't, Parker. Parker wasn't in the rankings, but the fights on the weekends haven't been taken into consideration okay. yet. So I think in January you'll see Junior move up further, and you may see Joe back in there. I mean, I think that's the hard thing. I mean, we all know Joe's an excellent boxer, right? Yep. And I think that the ESPN rankings are a really good gauge of who the top 10 guys are. They're independent. They're not a sanctioning body. We're really chuffed the WBO rate is so high. And one day we hope to be in the ESPN, you know, you know, rankings as well. But we all know Joe's a highly ranked fighter. And <clears throat> it's just it's tougher coming off a couple of losses from a ranking point of view. We, 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 we get the game. It's a, it's a game. And... And in saying that, obviously you saw the uh, presser with Kevin Barry and Joseph yeah. Parker. Up and what are your thoughts? I mean, it looked like Kevin Barry was quite enraged and almost tried to put a stop to any junior far questions. What are your thoughts? Oh, I mean, yeah, um, it's a real funny one. I don't really know how to, um, what's the right word? I, don't, I, don't, I can't really understand it all. I'm at the way and Kevin was obviously really keen to point out that he'd offered us a fight and he, he said we'd turned it down and we needed two or three more fights. Well, that, that, that's not correct. We... We said we'd fight straight away. What we said was, is for the promoter to make money out of it, probably needs two or three years to cook. Mm. It's all nice and fun that all the boxing people know that Junior Farr and Joseph Parker brands, but the general public does not yet know Junior Farr. They know Joseph Parker. He's like Alan P. He's world famous in New Zealand. He's done an amazing job. And I don't know if you noticed, we never call Joseph Parker out. We just say, they ask us if we want to fight, or the media ask us, we go, absolutely, but got to be commercial terms have got to be mm. right so I mean I think they they said the purse would be less than 100 grand and it's just like wow I mean if you can get the fight for 500 grand in two or three years time or you can get the fight for 100 grand now what are you going to take exactly you know you only get the fight once and if it's a great close fight you might fight again but so 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 to hear to Kevin to say that we'd turn the fight down well that was incorrect so he obviously was quite keen to talk about Junior Farr and Joseph Parker and then the fight happened and Junior blew a guy away in 80 seconds and all of a sudden Kevin Barry doesn't want to talk about it and says we're a joke and this and that and we should fight someone in the top 200 which is quite funny because Flores was 179. And the <laughs> yeah, funny thing was about a month before the fight, um, Rossi was ranked about 183. Yep. And there was four bits, there was four rankings different at the time the fights were made. And then because Rossi hadn't fought for a year, he became technically inactive at box track. <clears throat> and then he re-entered at 2.20 after a loss. So there was only four spots. But look, box rec, you can find guys in box rec that are, that are rated low, that are really good, and you can find guys that are really bad that are rated high. And <clears throat> to be honest, we don't look at box rec at all when we're yep. making decisions on who to fight. We wanted to fight a southpaw with some range, yep. and that was our goal. And that's why we, we picked Rossi. And we looked at his tape, and he was a competitive fighter and went in there. It's inevitable that, that JP and Far will meet, but from what you're saying, you, you're sort of going down your own track at the moment, and you, oh, you're following totally. a different path that's a little bit more strategic, and eventually, though, you will oh, sit look, down and come to some sort of agreement with Team Duco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, at the end of the day, David Higgins owns the company, right? And I think Kevin is... Uh, I don't know if Kevin works for David or what, how it works, because obviously... David pays the bills, so David's in charge. So I talk to David about it, not to Kevin. Kevin's the coach. Doug's yeah. the coach. If Kevin and Doug want to have a chat about it, let the coaches have a chat about it. Good luck with that one. But mm. for me, I talk to David. David's the promoter and the commercial guy. And so, yeah, like I said, it's a bit strange that Kevin brought it up at the weigh-in and then doesn't want to talk about it after the fight 24 hours later. Is, mm. that is, I, I can't say why, but we've got the greatest respect for what they've achieved, for both what Kevin yeah. and Joseph have achieved, eh? It's amazing, right? Looking at the path of, I guess, trajectory in, in terms of their success, it, you know, it's kind of like a blueprint for, for others or well, boxers' success yeah, and, and in like a sense. I, like I said before, I mean, like we're sold with, with this light heavyweight soul and, you know, we got to number one. Like there's a, there, there is a blueprint how to do it. Absolutely. <clears throat> and it's a development game, so we, we, we bring them along at the right time. And, hey, look, we were absolutely wanting a bit more of a fight on Saturday night. Yeah, and and that's just the way it is. So, so all Junior could do is do his job, and that's what he exactly. did. And you know, Rossi broke his nose in the first thirty seconds of the fight. So as soon as he broke his nose in the first thirty seconds, he probably wasn't having a lot of fun. No. Didn't throw a lot of punches, but Junior Far just pounced on him, and he sparked him with a pretty nice right hand. It was exceptionally well timed. What else can we ask for? An exceptionally well timed oh, right hand, right on the chin. Great performance. Great, it was great, great way right. to finish the year. And, yeah. and in saying that, what were your thoughts on Joe Parker's performance? Do you, what are your thoughts on the low blows? Well, Joe looked amazing, eh? I mean, you know, Joe looked awesome. You know, he looked in great shape. He was aggressive. 
you know, some people criticise that as um, that he didn't show anything different than what he has in other fights. But what he showed was he showed his mental attitude and his physical shape. It was brilliant. Um, I think Kevin prepares him mentally really well, actually. Um, you know, and you can prepare fighters as mentally mentally really well, and sometimes on the night they just don't pull the trigger like you want, right? But I think that they did an amazing job. I think that by looking at the tape, he obviously, you know, the belly button's the is the point. Yeah. Joseph Parker did not hit him in the bulls. He didn't, you know, wriggle around on the canvas. We've all had that shot yeah. at some stage in yeah. our life, and when we get hit there, it's not very fun. So I don't think Flores got hit in the in the, in the bulls. I think that um, obviously the lower abs are a bit weaker than the upper abs for taking shots, so that's why it's illegal. Um, I think that when you're training to hit around the belly button, and depending on where the guy's sitting down or standing up, sometimes that those shots can be a few centimetres either side. So There is a saying, as you know, protect yourself at all times. Yeah, that's it. And right. there was a slight, I'm not saying this is the same category, but you would have seen the Mayweather uh, fight against, not Maidana, but um, another Mexican fighter, I think it was Ortiz, he looks at the ref, then Mayweather popped him. So you should always just be looking at the fight, keeping your uh, eye on the prize, right? So he shouldn't yeah, really right. looked away. So I think that it's a strategy. It's a strategy to hit someone in the belly button. And like I said, that means some are going to go slightly higher, some are going to go slightly lower. Um, what they do with that is another kettle of fish. Did he win in a foul? Nah, I don't think so, but that's up, not, not for me. You know, he finished him after that. Um, it absolutely affected him. Absolutely, you can mm. see that because you see that. But um, you've got to defend yourself. And so, if he'd had his had his hand up on that chin, then he probably wouldn't have got hurt like that. And True. that's a so. <clears throat> but you know, like, what can you say? He was mentally prepared. He executed, and yep. he was in physical good shape. So, high five to Joe. And I'd say Joe. I mean, who knows who Joe will fight next? I mean, they're talking about Lucas Brown. Um, that'd be a great fight. As you just read my mind, actually. I obviously know Lucas Brown was recently over in New Zealand. Big Daddy Brown. He fought uh, Pitbull Party yep. out at uh, Auckland Stadium. Now, what are your thoughts on um, Big Daddy and would he be a good lineup for Far down the track? Is it, is it a good strategic fight move for Yeah, I mean, we've, we've got a couple of things in the pipeline at the moment. And so, you know, hopefully we're fighting in March, early, late February, early March in the States. Okay. And then hopefully something pretty big. We're negotiating something pretty big at the moment, and so, you know, I think everyone wants to see whether Junior's Junior's here or not. You know, I think we all look at him and go, he's got the size, he's got the skills, mm. he's got the speed, he's got the power, um, but can he uh, can he mentally turn himself on when it counts? And I, you know, that's what Joseph Parker showed in um, the White fight, where, you know, he was really unlucky. I, like I don't think White headbutted him, but he certainly got hit with his head, mm. and it certainly wasn't a knockdown. It was really unlucky, and we all wanted Joe to win, and he looked. You know, and then he, but but he got up from it. Mm, yeah, and he sure did. And he kept executing, right? You know, and so, what you know, Junior Fight hasn't been tested like that. Are you able to allude to what fight is, is potentially lined up in the states? Oh, March? I, I can't really say too much. I mean, a lot of it comes down to the status of the fight. It's going to be irrelevant to who fights Fury and uh, uh, sorry, who fights AJ in, in April. So. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. So the heavyweight division's a bit on hold at the moment. All of a sudden, like yep. big yep. pause. Who's, who's AJ fighting in April? Who's Wilder fighting next? Are they fight? You know. So did you call like when that fight happened with Wilder and Tyson? Uh, sorry, yeah, Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury. Did you think it was going to be a draw? Who did you think had won? What well, did you I want, knew, I knew want to that, happen? I knew that Wilder was hurt, and of course that's something I couldn't tell people. And so we knew Wilder was hurt going into the fight. Oh, okay. Yeah, so Wilder broke his arm three months from the fight. So we knew he was hurt. And we yep. weren't, we didn't know because they told Junior. We knew because as soon as Junior came home, he said, I said, how was it? And he goes, I think he's hurt. They haven't said anything, but he didn't throw his right hand much. So then right after the fight, they went, actually, I broke my bone in my right arm three months before the fight. I had surgery instantly. So to be able to be in a fight with Tyson Fury after a broken arm was a pretty impressive thing. So we knew that something was wrong. Mm. And so I think in the context of... It wasn't the perfect preparation. Like Junior had a lot of jabs thrown at him and not mm. so many rights. And the right would only kind of come in the first couple of rounds of sparring. And so, so Junior suspected it, that something was hurt. And, and then it came out. And so we, 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 knew, we knew that. So we knew that it was going to be interesting because Wilder was slightly not, not in perfect shape. With Far going over to the States as well, spending that time with Wilder, does it give him a, a sort of sense of um, how, 
you know, self-promotion, brand awareness, marketing. Do you see a different sort of flair with the American fighters as opposed to the Kiwi guys and how they promote themselves? Oh, yeah, I mean, Deontay Wilder's an incredibly nice guy yeah. and he's really welcoming to Junior and, and you know, they were they all ate together on Thanksgiving and, oh. you know, Junior's at the coach's house and it's yeah. a really nice family environment and there's no kind of, there's no kind of, uh, I'm going to fight Wilder next and I'm just trying to figure it out yeah. and, you know, it's not like that. It's a family and we've been invited back to, to come next time he fights, which is it's just a family thing you know yep. and we're not rated in the wbc so you know we're we're we're, we're not looking at deontay wilder or even considering him at the moment we're we're, we're part of his team i guess you know yeah, and, that's and that's how we look at it and then one day one day in the future who knows what will happen but but it's certainly not something we're thinking or talking about we're actually just there to help deontay totally and at the same time it helps us and so <clears throat> yeah i mean but junior's not a guy that he's such a lovely family man and he can't be like Deontay is a really nice guy, but he'll talk some smack, right? Yeah. And he'll say some stuff, and they'll get some headlines. Junior will never do that. Like I said, that's why you don't see Junior saying silly things about Parker and Barry and that. He he, he will answer the question, "When will you fight?" And he's got, "I'll fight any time." And of course he will. He's a fighter. He yeah. likes fighting. He really enjoys the sport. So that's why he won't mind fighting. As the management team and and Lou DeBell is a promotional guy, we have to we have to kind of find the pathway that suits best suits him to get there and to make money. You remember this is business. So I think, you know, all the boxing, you know, blogs and that, you know, people are blogging about the sport rather than the business. Oh, I'd like yep. to see Junior face this guy. Like love to see Parker versus Pavetkin or I'd love to see him versus this. And that's the sport side of it, going, we love the sport. And then the business side of it is, is that, well, you know, you've got to be calculated with how much risk you take relative to the money on the table. So just just going back to that, you said uh, Jonte does talk a bit of smack at times, or you know yeah. can hype it up. And Far is a bit more reserved, humble, and that's just the way he is, right? So you, yeah, you can't really guy. change you know, who he like is. When Junior came back to the corner, he just started crying on Saturday night. I was just like, "What's wow. going on?" I was just like, you know, and I just didn't realise the impact of his friend's child dying had yeah. on him. And he, he said it himself. I mean, he but he's he's proud of that. He was upset. Yeah. He's he feels for that family. He prays for that family, and he. And he wants to help that family because they're friends and they're from the same church and it's really sad for him. So I was really impressed with Junior's mental strength that he didn't, he said it to us on Wednesday night after it happened, he goes, oh, you know, if any of our kid died today, but I'm just, I'm just kind of, I'm not, I'm not really upset about it. It's kind of like I'm so focused on the fight that it hasn't really, you know, penetrated me. And we didn't really talk about it ever again. Wow. And we're like, wow, Junior, it's a, f it's a full on thing. It's in the media massively. And yeah. And then straight after the fight, he just came straight back and started crying, and he couldn't talk. Wow. And I'm like, mate, you okay? What's up? And he's just like, well, look, I've just, just hit me, completely hit me about my friend's ch child dying. So, <clears throat> you know, that's Junior. And he'll say that. But, well, how many how many heavyweight boxers are going to come and say, oh, by the way, agree. I've just cried in the corner to my team because I'm really upset that a friend of mine's kid died? No one does. We spoke about that last time, too, and it just goes to show, I guess, the trust, um, the level sort of relationship you guys have now and how open – open ears and it's quite important right moving forward because you've got to work with this guy day in day out you've got to know what's on his mind yeah you've got to have what he's going through right you can't communicate without vulnerability and honesty mm. you need to be vulnerable you need to be vulnerable in the fact that you need to be able to hear things you don't want to hear you need to be able to be honest so that you tell people sometimes what they don't want to hear you know if something's not working out i mean we knew it didn't work out our last fight we had a meeting about it the next day yeah i said i said to junior and his wife i said that didn't work out very well. We need to get to the bottom of it and find out what the story is because we have to change it. Well, that was the fight here on Shane Cameron's Yep, exactly. Case, and Junior yeah. went, yep, I couldn't throw any punches. I was worried about my elbow that I'd hurt earlier. I didn't want to hurt it. I had no, I had no, I I felt like I had no energy to throw second phase. I said, okay, well, at the end of the day, if, you were, if your elbow was bothering you that much, I need to know that. Mm. And <clears throat> we went through those tests and we found out that something was wrong. But... You know, like I said, honesty and vulnerability is critical for success. No, nothing's going to be perfect. I mean, like Junior, Junior busted his knuckle up. You know, on David Light's head. You know, <laughs> you know he Poor busted, David Light. He busted his knuckle. <laughs> well, I mean, Junior goes. Junior doesn't punch. Junior's a great sparring partner. He doesn't go hard. Yeah. He's he's technical in sparring. If you guys come and watch David Light and Junior fast spar, you know, Junior's not going hard. He's a cruiserweight, right? You know, just different size man. Yeah. David's a tremendous cruiserweight. And Junior's a heavyweight. I'd love to see that, them spar. No, it's great, but yeah. I mean, it's just technical sparring for Junior, and it's probably a little bit harder for David because mm, he's, he, he, can, he can whack him a bit harder than Junior can whack him. And so, you know, that's just that's just part of it. But um, David's, um, yeah, but he, but he hurt his knuckle on his forehead. So just, just one of those things. So he didn't punch for two weeks before the fight with the right hand. So, 
we had to use it in the fight. So uh, obviously a lot's changed since um, the blood results. And eating as well, you spoke on that before. Do you do you plan out his food? Does he see a nutritionist? What yeah, happens he's there? got a nutritionist and you know, we work with the doctors and we just have to be really careful with his um, with his diet and he, he's really good at that now. Like I said, for what he learnt from the day he turned pro to what he knows now, he's an he's an athlete yep. and he doesn't train if he's just because he's got a fight. He trains because he's an athlete. And he has Saturday afternoon off and he has Sunday off and that's it. He yep. trains five and a half days a week, spends family and church on Saturday and Sunday, spars on Saturday morning and that's just what he does. Have you told him over Christmas period, you know, no uh, too much turkey, no well, too much it's Christmas just, cake? It doesn't matter what time it is, it's just like he's got a week off training after a fight. I mean, he did 80 seconds of work, yep. so it's not like he's bruised and battered and, you know, yeah, I mean, true. I seen him for an x-ray on his knuckle yesterday, or today actually, just because we've got to check it out. Um, his, his uncle died just before the fight as well, so um, he had the funeral and a whole lot of stuff this week, and so he'll just be spending time with family. He'll start um, training normally next week, as far as fitness is concerned. Yep. Christmas is just the day that you train on. Exactly. You know? Yep. And, and saying that, obviously things are finished up for the year, um, a few fights line up next year. Going back to the whole park of 500,000 thing, if yep. they offered that, or if the, is that where you guys are at in terms of what you'd set the fight for? Would you go lower than the no. 500,000 mark? No, no, we wouldn't go lower, no. No, no, because we know that it's worth it. You know, and if, if we know it's worth it, yeah. It's just that's what it's worth. It's not worth it right now, because yep. you can't sell enough paper for you to pay both guys right now. But that's because, you know, but that's, but we know that at some point that will happen. Like we discussed earlier, it's probably best that Far <coughs> keeps going on his journey, Parker goes down his, and like, don't, inevitably don't they'll meet. Let's say, let's say Junior can't, um, let's say Junior didn't make it and he, and, he, and he lost a couple of times to guys he should have beaten and they were journeymen and he lost and, you know, I don't think it's going to happen, but let's just say that that's happened. Then, then we'd have to reassess the price, wouldn't we? Because yeah. we weren't necessarily worth it. But as an undefeated prospect who's ranked number 10 in the WBO, you know. Well, this thing, he's ranked high now. And I think this is one thing New Zealand media and public will struggle with is that look at Tyson Fury and Wilder. There was a lot of hype, a lot of talk. Joseph Parker and Farr aren't going to have that much smack talk. You know, Farr did beat Junior, uh, Farr did beat Parker in the amateurs, mm. just like Dillian White, Ag Anthony Joshua. But they're not going to have too much of a, I guess, smack talk or heated debate well, in the press conference. Jun I, don't, I think Junior and Joseph are just really nice guys, actually. Yeah. And. Um, and I'll just be honest about why we do things, and that might not go down so well with some people, but that's just what I have to do, is be honest. Exactly. And I have to give my reasons for that. It's not like, hey, yeah, we want 500 grand so the fight doesn't happen. No, no, we just want 500 grand. Mm. You're not making excuses for it not to happen. This is just as your benchmark, saying, or you think it's worth. I'm saying, yeah, we only get to have the fight once. So if someone said to you, you know, <clears throat> Here's a house that can be worth a million dollars, but I'll buy it off you right now for a hundred grand. But in three years' time or four years' time, it's worth a million bucks. You don't sell it for seventy-five grand, are you? Mm. Or a hundred grand? Why would, why would you no. do that? It's the same on. thing here. Hold on. Why, why would I? Why would I sell him sh short? Okay, so let's say, um, if uh, let's say Junior wins, Joseph's just Joseph's going to get nailed in the media yep. and internationally. Let's say Joseph wins. Well, Junior's got to take two or three years to rebuild back to where he was. Exactly. So if you want to pay, happy days. We'll go, we'll play. Yeah. You know, I think, T, uh, I think News Hub reported it that Kevin said um, that it was, um, that they offered us 500 grand, which is incorrect. They never offered us 500 grand. I just think that was a typo in the media. Sure. I think there's a bit of confusion on that. Just by talking to you today, though, it just sounds like we're on different paths, and I just want to keep them see them go their separate ways but eventually they're going to meet because it, it's inevitable people want to see it it will well, make sense but not right it. now I think New Zealand will demand it at some point but it, New Zealand's not demanding it right now Yeah, New Zealand's demanding Joseph fight top guys yeah. that are that are you know the Dillian Whites and the Derek Chisoras and the, and, the, and the AJs and the Wilders that's what they're demanding right now that's what they want to see exactly <clears throat> and that's fair enough and they want to see us fight guys at, at the next level as well and then as Junior's brand goes up and as Junior, uh, as Joseph continually, you know, consolidates his, because Joseph's going to be around for another five, six years. He's, man, he's a young guy. He's been the heavyweight world champ. He's made it. He's, he's flat out made it. And like I said, we are, we are really um, proud of what he's done as Kiwi fighters, you know, that we're really proud of him. What and him and Kiev have done has been great. Everything sounds pretty commendable. Like you said, you talked to Higgins. We were there. You guys talk openly, you know, as, as mates almost. But, um, 
Farr did say in the conference, and we'll probably chat to him about it too, that he thinks that they don't like him. But I don't know if that's the case. No, I think it's probably Kevin that doesn't <laughs> like him. You know? It's really weird because yeah. Kevin's never rated him. And that's okay. He's allowed to. Yeah. Kevin Barry is an exceptionally experienced manager and coach of fighters for a very long time. He completely outstrips me from the boxing world. I came from a different background. I've got experiences he doesn't have in other areas. You know, I work heavily in high performance sport and other sports. Um, people like Jack O'Girl and I coach in high performance with uh, track sprinters. So I have a different set of skills than Kevin, but Kevin's exceptionally experienced. Kevin probably, like I said, he doesn't want to... It's funny because, he, he's, like he said, he doesn't want to hear the talk, but on the flip side of it, he wants to bring it up. You know what I mean? Exactly. David Higgins rang me. Media found out about it. All good. We talked about it. Yep, didn't happen. So, like I said, the fact that Kevin wants to talk about it, he wants to talk about it. The only thing that changed was that Junior knocked to go out in 80 seconds. That was yep. it, right? And all he did was not want to talk about Junior versus Parker and that Junior's opponent wasn't credible, which I found quite ironic considering Flores was ranked about the same in the world. That's a good but, point. you know. And what's next on the cards? You know, you see you've got Jacko Girl, you've got Far. Are there any other uh, athletes you've got in the stables that are up and coming or any other boxers that you're looking at well, here in New Zealand? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm helping Hemi Ahio, and so he's 12-0, and 0, and he's obviously a bit of dynamite, right? And So much power in those hands. Yeah, man, and he, he, just, he, just, he just can flick the switch real quick and hit hard. And he moves fast and he hits hard at the same time, and so it's kind of, he can bridge that gap so quickly. He's a very powerful man. Do him yeah. and Far get a few rounds in? Do they yeah, spar? Yeah, they're sparring partners. They're training partners and sparring partners. Every morning they train together, every afternoon they train together. And they spar together twice a week, and it's great. Because Faz in the WBO, will Hemia here go in different uh, organisations, or you, tr or you well, still place him wherever he needs to go to get to I mean, to the seriously, one of the first things when I started managing Junior, I was like, well, Junior, there's a lot of good Tongan boxers like Solomon Amoma and Bowie Tupu, and I mean, not that you'd fight John Havawati, he's gone, but, you know, I mean, yeah. there's some good Tongan boxers out there, you know, Wild Bill, you know, Nasio, yeah, yeah. So William Nasio is actually Junior's cousin, so that's <laughs> okay. so that's off. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, Bowie Tupu is Hemi's cousin, so that's off. Wow. You know, and Junior was just like, look, I don't want to fight any Tongans. There's enough people in the world for me to fight. I don't yeah. need to fight my own countrymen. Yeah. So he's a really proud Kiwi Tongan. You know, and he doesn't want to fight those guys. So Hemi and Junior were they've always trained together, apart from the last couple of years. Yeah. But as when Hemi was coming up, Junior would come in and help him. But they're both at such different levels. Not, I guess, skill, power in any sense, but more so their rankings, right? Hemi here, here wouldn't be as highly ranked as far no, at the stage. No, but you've got you to remember that three years ago, Hemi was ahead of Junior by yeah. a long shot. You know, Hemi was 9-0 and and Junior hadn't even had a fight yet. So Hemi had the jump from a year or, t a year or two above. And then for whatever reason, I'm not even, I'm not even sure why, but Hemi, Hemi sat on the sidelines for, for two or three years and Junior had 15 fights and got ranked in the top top 10 in WBO. So, look, Hemi will have his own pathway. Hemi's a six foot one, 110 kilo explosive fighter. He'll fight different type of guys. Um, he'll be, you know, so he'll, he'll, be, he'll, be, he'll have a different path in that respect on who he fights, how he develops. I think he'll have two or three more fights in New Zealand and then we'll, we'll send him offshore, hopefully. And So a lot of the training, too, would be down just the road at CKV, City yep. Kickboxing. Yep. Do, do they ever st are they even going to come over to where you train the high-performance guys as well? Is there, are uh, you going to yeah, be a mix well, of that? Yeah, well, I mean, Junior does a bit of training down there um, with some of the track guys um, okay. in the, for the rotation and force production stuff. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I, look, Hemi's, Hemi does his tr S and C slightly differently than Junior. Yep. So um, whether, whether he starts coming along there or not, but I don't know that Sons does a great job with Hemi and with Israel, so, he, he, so the S&C stuff's just slightly different between Junior and Hemi, okay. I guess, just slightly different teams with treatment, physio and nutrition, like, you know, but under the same umbrella, the head coach is the head coach, you know, and, okay. and you know, obviously Doug Viney does a great job. And Eugene and uh, yeah, Mike, you'll I mean, get along with those guys down yeah, yeah, at City Kickboxing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're just a really good team, and they have, a, again, it's a really good culture. So they have culture that everyone goes, trains and fights hard, and then then they engage with the coaches. So when the coaches say to do something, they do it, you know? And look, Eugene always told me it takes nine months to a year before fighters start clicking, really clicking. And so Junior's just done his first year, so he's just starting to click. It's exciting, great. yeah. I mean, look, uh, whether it be boxing, the kickboxing, the MMA, it's quite an exciting time for New Zealand fighters. We're just sort of seeing them on the rise at the moment, aren't we? Yeah, I think I saw a Facebook post the other day where CKB was the number two gym in the UFC. I mean, there's a, there's a magic down there. 
but there's some magic dust in that gym and I think a lot of it is the culture they've created and it's pretty cool you go in on a Saturday morning to watch junior spar but there's actually 60 people sparring it's not just junior mm. sparring it's 60 people sparring and it's pretty cool and Israel and Dan Hooker are sparring <laughs> over here and you know you know, Brad, a Brad, pot. Brad, Brad Riddell and someone else is sparring and Kai is sparring and Shane and, and Junior and Carlos and it's just like in Hemi and Panuve it's like it's pretty pretty impressive and they all do it at the same time and do you still do a bit of training yourself? Get- no nah, I do no, I don't do any training eh, sadly whoopsie that's why I've got the table here <laughs> yep. um, so what's next on the cards you've got all these guys on your stable you've got a good thing going you're going away for Christmas oh no I'm just spending here. it what's going my on? Fam- just spending it with my family at home eh? just you know barbecues and relaxing and yep. you know i'll try and go for a few runs <laughs> oh we appreciate your time so anything oh, else you want to say to no, those watching back home no. merry christmas everyone have a good year don't eat too much over christmas <laughs> you have it cool. thank you cheers man.